Okay, welcome to the 30, 37th annual Marjorie Ward Lecture. Uh, my name is Chris Trott. I'm the Warden and Vice Chancellor of St. John's College. It's a real thrill tonight to have with us Professor Brenda Child from the University of Minnesota. And she's going to speak to us on Ellen Red Blanket and the origins of the jingle dress dance tradition in Ojibwe country. To, to begin tonight, I want to start with the land acknowledgement here in Winnipeg. St. John's College is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, and Dakota peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate the college as a whole to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So with that, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, points that we need to announce. One is that the entire presentation, the entire evening is being recorded. In fact, it's being recorded right now. Uh, so if you wish to come back and uh, review some of the uh, presentation or uh, to see it later on, we will be posting the, uh, the uh, link for the re recording later on. Um, and secondly, just to explain, if you go to the bottom of your screen, if you're uh, on a, a laptop of some kind or a, des a desktop, you'll see that there's a Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, we will have questions uh, at the end of the presentation. You'll be able to ask questions of, of uh, Professor Child. And uh, if you type them into the Q&A, then Dr. Jones and I will present the, uh, the questions to Professor Child. So please use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen for um, uh, asking any questions of Professor Child. Now, it's really my uh, privilege and honor to introduce you to you uh, Norman Mead, Elder Norman Mead, who is one of the elders at Magizi Agamik, uh, the Indigenous Student Center at the University of Manitoba. And Norman is going to open us with some thoughts, reflections, and prayers. Norman. Nice to see everyone uh, on my screen here. As I open in prayer today, I want to reflect on some things uh, briefly of why we are here tonight and say and and do a prayer but i want to welcome uh, dr brenda child who we're going to listen to tonight who will bring us that message of uh, ellen red blanket and uh, and the jingle dress dance and the healing that goes with that we call on the spirits our ancestors and the great spirit tonight to welcome you into this place to this place in voice as our sister, Brenda. As we celebrate the 37th lecture tonight of one who has done so much work for this place, Marjorie Ward, we think of her and the work that she has done at this college and other places over her years of service. We know that 37 is a spiritual number as well it's a time of celebration, of healing, of wisdom, of work well done by Marjorie in the years that she spent. And we think about her. We call upon her spirit tonight to be with us. And as we listen to Dr. Brenda Child's message, we pray for open hearts. We pray for open minds and open spirits that all who are present and listening to this message of healing because that is what the jingle dress is about. It's about healing. We realize that the spirit of Ellen Red Blanket, although she has gone for many years, will be with us in spirit tonight. And we think about her spirit as well. We call upon her spirit to be with uh, Dr. Brenda Child as she teaches us about, uh, uh, about the jingle dress dance. And so the knowledge that we receive tonight we ask that the Creator pass that knowledge on to us, that we would remember those things as we move into truth and reconciliation of the work that we have to do in this country, Turtle Island, here on both sides of the border. And we are hoping and that the Spirit will move with us tonight uh, as we go and as we listen to to uh, to to. Uh, 
to Brenda's uh, presentation. Uh, not so long ago, we asked uh, in one of the meetings I sat with uh, one of the Ojibwe ladies, grandmothers who were there, to uh, say a prayer for us, given uh, that we have COVID upon us. And I really enjoyed her prayer. She said, we are blessed by you, O, o Creator. You who connects all of us as beings, your beings. We are blessed by Father, Son. You give us light and warmth and strength. We are blessed by you, Grandmother Moon. You teach us through our grandmothers the importance of reflection and of life itself. We are blessed by you, land and water, as we bless others. As we are loved, we love others. As we are healed, we heal others. As we are related to you and to one another, help us now that we could all heal together. Sing to us a new song. Sing to us through your voice that we would hear the sounds that mean so much to our children, even the unborn child. Help us now to heal, for that's why we are here. Bring peace to us, our spirits, our minds, and our bodies, O oh Lord. This is the prayer that one of our grandmothers had recently uh, recited for us and wrote for us. And I thought it was such a nice prayer. I would use that prayer tonight. So miigwech, thank you. And I will listen now. Bless you all. Thank you, Elder Norman. Uh, fine words to start us out with and a fine prayer to start us out with. Uh, I might be writing to you tomorrow to get a copy of that prayer to use it on other occasions. Um, if we have permission to do so, I would really appreciate that. For all of you who are here tonight to tell you that uh, St. John's College is the oldest post-secondary or the oldest English language um, uh, high, institution of higher education in Western Canada. Uh, we've been around, it depends on how you count the years, um, depends on whether you count us from 1820 or whether you count us from 1866. Um, 1820 through to 1866 was a number of predecessor schools to what finally became the college. Uh, the college was originally founded to educate um, First Nations and Métis students in the Red River Settlement. Uh, we were quite good at that until about 1875 when uh, Canadian policy disrupted, destroyed and undermined the lives of, of the Métis people in this, in this part of the world, uh, at which point we turned and, and really became a, a fairly establishment uh, college. And we are struggling now to, to recognize that past and to, to try and uh, reorient ourselves in ways that, that reflect our history more appropriately. Um, the, we are also one of the founding colleges of the University of Manitoba, and we try to remind them of that, but they tend not to, they tend not to remember that. Tonight's lecture is named after Marjorie Ward, and as, as Norman mentioned, uh, Marjorie was, uh, um, uh, worked at the college. I actually got the figures now. She worked from 1951 until 1980 at the college, so just under 30 years at the college. Um, she was the registrar of the college, and as registrar, that meant that she was in charge of uh, enrolling all of the students in the college and enrolling all the students in their programs. So she had close relationships with all of the students, including myself, by the way. I, when I first came to the college, Marjorie was still the registrar at the college. Um, she was born and raised and lived most of her life in Winnipeg until she retired and she moved to Okanagan. Um, and this lecture was established in 1980 uh, to honor her. Um, the fellows of the college raised the, uh, the endowment for this lecture and we have basically had it since, uh, since 1980, uh, not quite continuously, but since 1980 when it was established. Marjorie died now five years ago in August of uh, 2016 uh, in, in the Okanagan, still a strong supporter of the college and still a strong supporter of uh, the, the church in Winnipeg. She was an absolutely remarkable person. She was incredibly kind, but uh, how do I put this without coming out wrong? She was very firm. 
if you were being a cheeky young undergraduate, she certainly could rather quickly put you in your place. And, uh, uh, but she was delightful in terms of that. So that is the lecture that, we, that honors Marjorie Ward. And um, I'm now gonna ask uh, Professor Essel Jones, who is the Dean of Studies at St. John's College to introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's my honor to introduce this year's Marjorie Ward Lecturer. Brenda Child is a distinguished scholar and a beautiful writer. And she is Northrop Professor and former Chair of the Departments of Amer American Studies and American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. She's the author of several books in American Indian history, including Boarding School Seasons, American Indian Families, 1900 to 1940, uh, published in 1998, which won the North American Indian Prose Award. Holding Our World Together, Ojibwe Women and the Survival of Community from 2012, an Indian subject's hemispheric perspectives on the history of indigenous education with Brian Klopotek, Klopotek um, in 2014. That same year, she published My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks, Ojibwe Family Life and Labor on the Reservation, which won the American Book Award and the best book in Midwestern history. She's also the author of a best-selling bilingual book for children, Bow Wow Pow Wow 2018. That's a great title. Uh, she was a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian from 2013 to 2018 and president of the Native American Indigenous Studies Association from 2017 to 18. She's a member of the board of the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Dr. Child was born on the Red Lake Ojibwe Reservation in Northern Minnesota, where she is part of a committee developing a new constitution for this 12,000 member nation. Dr. Child's work has a special resonance for me because of her insights into indigenous experiences during the great influenza pandemic which is a disease outbreak I've written about, but I never tire of re-examining. Her chapter on the pandemic in my grandfather's knocking sticks draws our attention not only to the deep impact the pandemic had in Red Lake Indigenous community, but also the agency of Indigenous women as healers, both in their own communities, as well as in settler society, where they worked as trained and volunteer nurses. Her work on the pandemic speaks to us today in a way we scarcely imagined a year ago, and I'm deeply grateful to her for sharing it with us. Great, thank you. Um, I was just saying great about getting unmuted, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. This was really a very warm and beautiful uh, welcome. Uh, thank you to Elder Mead. Thank you to Professor Jones. Thank you to the um, entire faculty and staff at St. John's College uh, for inviting me to present the 37th annual Marjorie Ward Lecture. I enjoy saying her name and especially um, since learning a little bit about her working life and her personality, I, I think I enjoy it. Uh, even more. That's really wonderful that you have established this uh, lecture recognizing her. I sincerely wish, of course, that I could be with you in person, um, not just to, to chat with all of you before and after the lecture and to be with all of you, but I heard that you have a very nice lecture or reception that I'm feeling cheated out of. Uh, and I was just thinking about this week last year, as many of you probably have been recalling the last social events. And uh, a week or a year ago, I was traveling and I did some work in New York. Um, then I went to Washington DC and ended up in Toronto. So I was actually in Canada on this day last year. And then when I flew home a couple of days later, it was the Friday evening, I think it was the 6th of March. And I noticed that there weren't very many people on the airplane. <laughs> and there was that feeling, you know, that life was changing. But of course, we didn't really know the extent of what this past year would be like. And it's, it's been uh, quite a year for us all. 
Um, this is great. I love um, talking about the jingle dress dance uh, tradition. And as many of you know, it is an Ojibwe tradition that is now a century old. That's interesting. And uh, a few years ago, I was organizing an exhibit, Zabaska, Igana Good Day, um, to go up on the Mille Lacs Reservation, where my husband's from, just a little bit north. I point because it's like um, two hours north of here. And that is the community where the jingle dress originated in Minnesota. And so, and there's, I will get into talking about how there's a place of origin also in, in Canada up in Ontario. But I was working on this uh, exhibit for the hundredth anniversary. We opened in 29 and who would have thought at that time, I've been trying to get everyone like Professor Jones to think about this really, these really interesting events of a century ago, not many people knew about it. It's kind of an obscure historical topic. And now of course, all that has changed. So the jingle dress dance has evolved over the course of the century since its origin. It's been very, uh, you know, very much part of the social life and the ritual of powwows, but also of other kinds of dances that are performed. And here in Minnesota and in Wisconsin, uh, in this uh, part of Ojibwe country, it um, is also was also early on part of the big drum ceremonies. The jingle dress dance is indigenous to Ojibwe people of both the United States and Canada, but it also became a Dakota tradition very early on. And the Dakota, Dakota and listening to your land acknowledgements, of course, the Dakota people are our closest neighbors in Minnesota and also, of course, very close neighbors in Manitoba as well. So it would be kind of a regional tradition all these decades. But since the 1980s, it began to be very widely adopted by other indigenous women, especially as the powwow circuits were expanding, I think, during those years. The jingle dress dance tradition is about healing the body, but it's also about the mind. And I also think it's especially about the aftermath of grief. And in that sense, it is profoundly about love, love for your relatives and community, and even for those who have left this world. In this year of loss, perhaps more than at any time in our lives, we better understand the suffering of people who survived the pandemic of 1918-19, which was deeply felt in Ojibwe country of the US and Canada. And of course, the border meant nothing in the spread of disease. So Teresa, maybe we'll just look at the first slide, which is actually from my own community in Northern Minnesota. I'll be talking about a number of Ojibwe communities in Minnesota, but this is where I'm from. Um, I always, you know, I'm very proud of uh, being from Red Lake where have kind of an unusual history in the United States because after we negotiated a major treaty, we didn't um, make any more land sessions. We didn't uh, ever allot the reservation and it's still owned communally today as it was um, you know, for generations and generations. So the Ojibwe jingle dress dance at the time of this photograph was a rather new tradition, but it has endured and it has evolved to fit the needs of people over time. I learned about the tradition from my grandmother, Jeanette Aganash. She was a jingle dress dancer nearly all her life. She would have been a teenager during the pandemic and the tradition stayed with her. And it was very much for you know, the rest of her life, a very big part of her identity as an Ojibwe woman. Here in, great, in the Great Lakes, the homeland of 200,000 Ojibwe people, the Anishinaabe have deeply integrated the memory of this epidemic into our traditions of song and dance. So I'm interested in um, 
the tradition. I'm interested as an Ojibwe woman, but also as a historian. And it's, was, it's quite fascinating to me the way we carry the strong historical memory of the pandemic. Every time the jingle dress is performed, I argue, we are remembering the worldwide epidemic of influenza that spread in three waves in the spring and fall of 1918 and the winter of 1919, killing 30 to 50 million people worldwide. Until now, the pandemic has been an event, strangely, I always think, without a strong historical memory in the US, US despite the loss at that time of 675,000 Americans. And you know, think of how in the US, we've just passed that terrible milestone of half a million deaths. In Canada, more um, people died of the pandemic. I don't mean more than the, in the US, but just another 58,000 approximately. Nearly as many Canadians um, died in the pandemic as died in the First World War. So it was a huge event. We can't underestimate that. So one place the influenza landed, which is kind of the topic I'm, I'm going to uh, treat tonight, is just kind of a little place in Ojibwe country where the pandemic landed among Minnesota's Ojibwe. And Teresa, if you would just want to move on to this first slide, I'm going to be talking about Bear Island. You see those beautiful shorebirds over there? I was there last August. This is a picture from my iPhone, right? This is not a fancy <laughs> picture in any way, but we were on a pontoon boat with, um, I was with a number of people who were from that area. And so I'm trying to think like, how would I say, as far as Red Lake, which is up in the northernmost Ojibwe community in Minnesota, at least in central Minnesota, um, we would be about, about an hour south to be at this location, another Ojibwe reservation called Leech Lake. So the, this is the island um, where Ojibwe people spent part of the year and um, the mainland is right across an area called Sugar Point um, on the Leech Lake Reservation. So the influenza pandemic reached Sugar Point in Bear Island in 1919. The latter is a small island in the middle of Leech Lake. And the reservation, also called Leech Lake, is the homeland to numerous bands of Ojibwe. Um, as Professor Jones knows, this unusual influenza was deadly to younger people, while elders were often left untouched. And so sort of the opposite of what we're dealing with, with the coronavirus. You can move on from my lovely photography to a historic photo. <laughs> yeah, I've always loved this photograph. Um, and it's after the pandemic, not during or before, it's after the pandemic. And this is a woman named, um, she's usually recorded in the, I'm having a hard time finding her name because the folks who wrote about it as many people did at that time, referred to as Mrs. John Paper. You referred to her um, by her husband's name. So this is Mrs. Paper and her daughters. And I always think this is a very a lovely photograph and you can see the work behind them. That is not just the wigwam, uh, the seasonal wigwam, but also the rolls of birch bark. So I, this tells me these women were very hardworking. So, Five years later, right? So this is five years after the pandemic at Bear Island with the pandemic behind them. An ethnobotanist from the Milwaukee Public Museum arrived on the island for research about Ojibwe knowledge of plants and medicine. His name was Huron Smith. Um, I always think that was a very cool name, very awesome. But he wrote a really chilling entry in his field notes. He said, the Ojibwe could not successfully fight the influenza attack of 1919, and the present population consists of only 14 persons. Wow, here's four of them right here, right? So he went on to enumerate the survivors. They included a man named White Cloud, his wife, 
and their son. For a month in the summer of 1924, Smith would study with and photograph the elders who were spared and still lived on Bear Island, including John Paper's mother, who they, you know how they always, I don't know the accuracy of this ages. Sometimes they were saying she was a hundred years old. She was aged, I've seen photographs of her. Before the pandemic, Bear Island was a microcosm of the Ojibwe world. Yet the history of Bear Island has been written as if every important detail happened in the fall of 1898. Eight years after the end of the Indian Wars in the US, a small fight broke out on Leech Lake between a loose collection of Ojibwe men who were outnumbered by US soldiers. I think Minnesotans overreacted to the event. A uh, town in Northern Minnesota, Bemidji, residents trembled, huddled in the courthouse, while in St. Paul, a Gatling gun was loaded onto the train and headed for the nearest station at Leech Lake, a town called Walker. At the end of a single day of fighting, 19 Ojibwe men allowed the 77 soldiers to withdraw with their numerous dead and wounded. Just one Ojibwe person was killed and that was friendly fire even, a policeman shot by the uh, soldiers. At the time, Minnesota was developing a vision for hunting and fishing in the state. They were supposed to be activities for recreation with seasonal limitations. Ojibwe men and women were criminalized increasingly, car incarcerated at the turn of the century for their work of hunting and fishing. Also, unlike in the rest of the Minnesota where immigrants brewed beer and opened distilleries, it was illegal to sell liquor on the reservation, which tended to be another source of unrest. You can go on to the next photograph. One Leech Lake man, Bugane Gijig, um, hole in the day, had been arrested related to charges um, dealing with alcohol, taken to Duluth for his um, hearing, and had to walk all the way home to Sugar Point on Leech Lake after his release from jail. I looked it up today, that would be about 130 miles to walk. And he was 60 years old at the time. So when authorities tried to arrest Bugganagish again in the fall, it led to a struggle. Ojibwe people hoped to protect him because he was the spiritual leader in the community. Bugganagish, never in the fight itself, fight itself, collected spent cartridge casings and strung them into an elaborate necklace to remember the event. He lived for 20 more years until 1918, which was the beginning of a global pandemic so invasive it would reach Bear Island in the following year. Um, I kind of like his shirt and his cartridge casings because there's something, uh, it kind of shows, I mean, it almost, uh, it was not unusual for men to wear jingly things on their clothing, even prior to the jingle dress. But that does not make a jingle dress, of course. The minute the Battle of Sugar Point, as it's often called here where I live, is I always think of it as a Minnesota story. So what if we set it aside and rewrite the history of Bear Island to include Ojibwe women? What if the clatter of cartridge casings became the healing sound of jingle dresses? The influenza pandemic of 1819 is part of this story, along with suffering and depopulation, but also survival. Bear Island was a place where people went in the springtime to prepare their gardens and gather medicines and plants for tea. Sometime during the pandemic and its aftermath, women created a medicine dress, a revolutionary new tradition of healing that appears to a surface simultaneously in Ojibwe communities of the United States and Canada, the jingle dress dance. So let's look at the next slide. Bear Island flint corn, wild rice, and the deep indigenous knowledge of the island's abundant plants and medicines might also shape this new narrative. 
They were fundamental to Ojibwe health and persistence. We can even rearrange the main characters on Bear Island and move away from military men and fighters as we refocus on women. Why not give them beautiful names? We can begin with Ellen Red Blanket. Huron Smith referred to Red Blanket as um, White Cloud's wife, but also noted her Ojibwe name in his field notes, Wasewanakud, meaning far away cloud. So the next slide, please. Ellen Red Blanket at Bear, photographed here by Huron Smith in 1924 on Bear Island. Ellen Red Blanket was born around 1870, and she was the daughter of Red Blanket, who was a hereditary chief at Leech Lake. Her name was recorded as Ellen White Cloud in official records because she was married to Wabashkanakud, or White Cloud. At this time, as many folks know, Ojibwe people were adopting surnames for legal reasons, primarily for school attendance, land allotments, and the US Census also. John White Cloud was recorded as age 69 in the census conducted at Bear Island in the spring of 1930. I had to go look them up. Amusingly to me, the census taker missed Red Blanket's age by a wide margin and recorded it as 44, though she too, like her husband, was closer to 60. And I like to think she was sort of having fun at the census taker's expense when he asked her age. And so she says, I'm 44. <laughs> Ellen Red Blanket spoke Ojibwe, so maybe communication wasn't perfect with the census taker, but everybody at Bear Island spoke Ojibwe. To me, the other part of the census that I know drives some of us crazy is that John White Cloud is listed as not just head of the household, but a quote, farmer. Since women in Red Blanket's time controlled the economic life within their communities, I always find this, um, you know, uh, inconsistent with how Ojibwe people think about their economic roles at the time. For Ojibwe people, water in particular was a gendered space where women held what you might call property rights. I don't think that's a very good term to use actually when, um, when you think of how Ojibwe people thought of these things, these legal issues. But women managed and performed much of the labor. And when it came to the wild rice harvest, which is really important, in this part of Ojibwe country, they were the primary harvesters of wild rice, which grew at Bear Island and is still today our sacred food. But thinking of this census taker, it was very hard for outsiders to see Ojibwe women for what they were, fisher women, harvesters of wild rice, agriculturalists and healers, and women like Red Blanket were expert at gathering plants. Bear Island was her medicine garden. This census taker recorded her occupation as none. So Ojibwe people also had a philosophy of, good, of a good life that Ellen Red Blanket and John White Cloud would have called Wenji Bema Dizieng. Ojibwe leaders evoked this idea frequently from what or where we get our living, our life. In treaty negotiation, they would employ this term to secure land and all the necessities of life for Ojibwe economic survival, but also for them to continue to lead meaningful lives. It was a philosophy, it was a prayer, but it was also a legal concept. Ellen Red Blanket and John White Cloud lived on Bear Island half the year as that was where they got their living, their life, and their necessities of vegetables, wild rice, berries, medicine. They planted gardens in spring, harvested wild rice in summer, 
hunted deer that roamed the island, women made and repaired fishing nets. Fishing at Leech Lake was amazing. Fully stocked for winter, they moved back to Sugar Point and the mainland with their Ojibwe relatives. So this was the place they lived half the year. Then they would go back. Huron Smith didn't seem aware that the, that the role the jingle dress played in healing, despite his fascination with plants and medicine. Of course, for Ojibwe people, plants and medicine go together with song and dance. Spiritual power for Ojibwe people moves through air, and so sounds hold significance. So metal cones are what make a jingle dress and produce this incredible sound. Smith photographed Red Blanket in her jingle dress, but with no mention in his field notes of the healing tradition that swept Ojibwe communities since the pandemic, or even the dress itself. But I often think that Ellen Red Blanket's portrait on Bear Island is perhaps the earliest photograph we can easily date of an Ojibwe woman in a jingle dress. So let's take a look at her dress close up here. Her dress was made by hand, a row of jingles at the shoulder, three more on the skirt in a dignified pose. She wants people to get the best view of her dress. <laughs> so the eye can take in every angle and detail of her ribbon work. Her jingles, each one made by hand are perfect. Even her sleeves are adorned with rows of ribbon sequence and jingles. In her mid fifties here, red blankets, hair is still black, held in place with a headband across her forehead. The texture of her dress makes it likely that it was made of black velvet, which Ojibwe people love as a fabric for dresses and beadwork. The old style jingles from this era have a tighter roll and can be sewn closely together on the dress. Hers might be made of tobacco, cans, or tins from other household items, even baking soda cans. With so many jingles close together, the old style jingle dresses produced a deeper resonance than those with the later Copenhagen tobacco lich or those that were rolled more loosely. You can go on to the next photo, Teresa. I just wanted to show you that how quickly the tradition moved into Dakota country, because here we are in probably North Dakota and you see Ojibwe, not just, not Ojibwe, excuse me, but Dakota people um, in the dress as well. Here in Minnesota, it started around the Mille Lacs region in central Minnesota, spread to other Ojibwe communities. And with a short time, it was adopted by Dakota, very widespread in Canada, around Whitefish Bay, Ontario, and at Mille Lacs in Minnesota and Ojibwe people up in Whitefish Bay tell almost the same exact story of the little girl who became ill, who became the first jingle dress dancer. Move on to a much later period. Teresa, the next slide, please. Decades later, in the 1980s, the healing tradition spread among many tribal nations on powwow circuits across North America. Jingle dress dancers assembled at Standing Rock to protest the pipeline project. And today, the 200,000 Ojibwe people of the US and Canada remember this pandemic in stories, song, and dance, a healing tradition that is now over a century old. And of course, it's had an interesting part to play in modern protest movements, Idle No More, as well as this very moving photograph by my colleague, uh, Eugene Tapahi of the Jingle Dress Dancers at Standing Rock. Just, I'm going to wrap up here in the next five minutes with my formal comments, and I'm going to try to leave, um, you know, time for us to for questions and talk. But let's go on to the next slide because I have just a few more to show you. So this is uh, Bear Island last August when I, we were around there with my colleague Eugene Tapahi, the photographer. When the Chippewa National Forest was established over 85% of the Leech Lake Reservation, which was finalized in 1928. The injustice to the people who lived there was staggering. Ojibwe allotments ended in the newly named Chippewa National Forest, 
and even signs appeared on the reservation to deter Ojibwe berry picking. The national forest status did not protect the land as the Ojibwe had, but rather the federal government moved in and exploited and profited from excessive timber sales in the forest. One Ojibwe leader at the time explained what it was like to live on 15% of their former reservation when he said, we are hardly able to breathe. Just this winter, I should say, not, um, I'm not gonna say it's a happy ending, but there has been a restoration of some lands back to the Leech Lake Ojibwe, which um, took an act of Congress. But I want to celebrate it at the same time, say that it was a modest restoration. So these are my colleagues' uh, daughters in the back who are Navajo, who are jingle dress dancers, just to show. Uh, these two young girls are the daughter of uh, family friends. I grew up with their grandmother. And this young lady in the middle, I want to just conclude my talk about. Her name is Daisy Ann Johnson. And Go on to the next slide. Ellen Red Blanket and John White Cloud survived the influenza at Bear Island, and Huron Smith noted their son survived as well. But Red Blanket also had an adult daughter, not noted by Smith. Her name was Grace. Two years after the pandemic, Grace's daughter, Daisy, Daisy with an S, Daisy Johnson was born on Bear Island on June 23rd, 1921. So just a couple years after the pandemic. Marlene Johnson Mitchell of Longville, Minnesota is Grace's granddaughter and Ellen Red Blanket's great granddaughter. Marlene studied business management at Bemidji State University in northern Minnesota and spent her career working as the executive director of housing for her tribe at Leech Lake, though she's now retired. This past summer and during another global pandemic, Mitchell joined an outing my friends and I and my husband had organized to Bear Island. It was a beautiful, cool evening in August, and we wanted to enjoy the last days of summer and take photographs. I persuaded a colleague, Eugene Tohapahi, to come out from Utah, a fine art photographer, and we went out on this pontoon boat to Bear Island. Masked, trying to keep our social distance, a family from Sugar Point, the White family, took us out on their pontoon boat. It was a really beautiful time. We could see the ripening wild rice around Bear Island. Mitchell brought along her granddaughter, Daisy Ann Johnson. Daisy with a Z pictured here in her jingle dress, just 19 years old. I suggested we photograph her in a jingle dress on the island. Daisy is the great granddaughter of Ellen Red Blanket's dot granddaughter, Daisy, one of the first Ojibwe born on the island after the pandemic. And our visit out to Bear Island was, I thought of it as kind of a tribute to the Ojibwe survivors of the pandemic a century ago, our ancestors who created the jingle dress dance tradition. Ellen Red Blanket lived a long life and Mitchell had strong memories of her great grandmother's stories. Ellen Red Blanket said their horses were the first to leave the mainland in the spring and the White Cloud and Red Blanket family would simply follow them across the frozen lake. Mitchell told us that their entire family was born and raised near Bear Island. She smiled and laughed often and we were very eager to hear about her family's connections to Bear Island. Her ancestors survived the first global pandemic in modern history, surely a tragic era, but
But most of all, Mitchell remembered Red Blanket's hopefulness and frequent words. It was the best life. So I think I'll end my comments there. I'll show you though, Teresa, we have a couple of other lovely photographs. If you would just show one more as people warm up to uh, think of what they want to ask. But this is a, this is just a, a mile of that a mile from my house. I live in St. Paul. I also have a place in Northern Minnesota, but I persuaded some of my uh, friends and colleagues, um, even students to come out and be photographed last summer to commemorate, to think about the last global pandemic. And here we are, you can see the St. Paul Capitol. And this is Mounds Park, uh, Indian Mounds, uh, that is a, a, a park in the city. And um, my mother was not a jingle dress dancer. My grandmother was. I have not been a jingle dress dancer either, although I danced at powwows as a girl. But the young woman on the left in her vintage jingle dress and her um, and her bandolier bag is my daughter, Benet Jeanette, who like her great grandmother is a jingle dress dancer. I think I have one more even. Oh, and the last thing I'll mention is that um, I have a short documentary called Jingle Dress Dancers in the Modern World. You can Google it, find it very easily on YouTube. We launched it in September and it's had 14,000 views on YouTube. And I wanted it to be free, accessible for people in tribal communities, to educators, and especially to my dear colleagues like myself teaching online <laughs> over Zoom. And I think that has been one reason for its popularity this past year, in addition to this topic of American Indian people, Indigenous people, Ojibwe people in pandemics. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to listen to comments or try to answer questions even. Well, I can so, see the okay, I can see the first question here. Mm -hmm. um, it says, "Thank you for this." I uh, it's from John Bupalan. I appreciate how you describe the healing tradition as arriving, rising out of grief. Is it then you think the widespread existence of grief over structural wrongs that enabled this tr tradition to spread across different tribal nations? Mm -hmm. That's a good and, and complicated question. You know, the other thing you have the jingle dress dance and, but it's also, and you have the pandemic, but there's a lot of complex politics. You know, I was suggesting to you just the brief story here of the loss of the so-called Chippewa National Forest being simply annexed out of the um, Leech Lake Reservation. This was a time in, on the US side of things of allotment and tremendous land fraud. The timber companies were um, overrunning Northern Minnesota. And so I think there was a lot of environmental degradation and a lot of loss of access to traditional places where Ojibwe people made a living. Not to mean mention just the loss of the land itself. So this was kind of the early 20th century, our big era of dispossession. So some of the things, you know, teaching Indian history, some of the things that happened kind of on the Northern Plains in the late 19th century happened in the Great Lakes for in indigenous people in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. So it wasn't just the pandemic. So we have a question here. Um asking about your, to tell us about your powwow experience as a child. <laughs> oh gosh, we went snagging, 
We did all sorts of crazy things when we were kids. Um, you know, I was a kid in the 70s, and that was the era when Indians were kind of popular again, you know, and we and there were fringe jackets and beadwork on hippies. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. And what we were into was buckskin and fringe. So my first dress, my mother kept talking about a jingle dress. And I was like, oh, mom, grandma has a jingle dress. I don't want to. You know, and this is like how stupid we are as children, right? How stupid we are. I didn't want to dress like grandma and all the old ladies at Red Lake. And there was kind of a sense in the 1960s, 70s that this was a dance performed by older women. Now, when you're 13 and 14, you don't always want, you're not wise enough to see that this is what you should be doing too. You want to do something hipper, cooler than grandma. I didn't know grandma was the ultimate in cool at the time. And so we, I had this really wonderful um, buckskin dress that was made. It was kind of a labor of love by many people. Um, every hole was made with an all through three, um, you know, kind of layers of buckskin. And my mother at the very end, threw in a layer of a row of jingles on the bottom of it because she just couldn't imagine a dress not being a jingle dress. But we, yeah, so that was my childhood um, story. The 70s, we were all about the long fringe and not so much what the older ladies were doing because, and it might've looked at that moment like it was a tradition on its way out. And then this big leap, in the 80s, right, where something happens. So it becomes hugely popular among young people, the way it is now. So and thanks for that question. I was gonna say, unfortunately, <laughs> I remember those days, although I was, I might've been wearing uh, buckskin fringes without, how do we say, with cultural appropriation. Yeah, but, uh, I yeah, have we long fringe jacket too. <laughs> It was, a, it was a while ago. So, okay, um, somebody has asked, where did the jingle dress originally come from? The United States? So we're getting into competition here. Did it originally come from the States or did it originally come from Canada? So in um, the Mille Lacs community here, which is where my husband from, take great pride. They tell the story. They know, they named the woman who was the first jingle dress dancer. Up in Whitefish Bay, they take great pride they have the same story. They named the young girl who was the first jingle dress dance dancer. The stories are almost identical about the little girl falling ill. Her father has this vision, the dress is made, she recovers. And that's kind of what made me start thinking about the jingle dress dance coming out of the influenza pandemic because um, the story was a very flu-like illness. You know how when you have the flu and you feel like, oh my gosh, I." You know, you can't do anything but sleep, you can't eat. And then, you know, you kind of turn a corner. And that seems to be what that story was about. Um, the way it's sometimes explained to me is that the jingle dress dance was given in a vision to Ojibwe people. So why does it need to um, come from one place? There could have been more than one or multiple sites of its origin because it came in a vision and was given to Ojibwe people. So we have a question asking you to speak about the symbolism of the jingle dress. Yeah, so the jingles, like I say, are what make a jingle dress. Um, in the Mille Lacs community, they, um, on that poster you may have seen for the, for the lecture, they, they have women who dance in those four colors, red, blue, yellow, green, at their powwows. That's how they start their powwows with um, the jingle dress dancers coming out in those four colors. So those, you know, that's, um, you know, kind of part of a tradition that you see at Mille Lacs. The jingles themselves, I think, have to do with 
um, the way that Ojibwe people conceive of spiritual power as moving through air. And because of that, the jingles themselves are very important. So it's the jingles that make a jingle dress. And um, one of the things we tried to show in our um, exhibit, Zabaska on a Good Day at the Mille Lacs Tribal Museum, is how the dress has evolved over the decades. Dresses in the 1920s were kind of simple shifts and tended to look, I would call them flapper-like styles of dress with jingles on them. In later years, in the 30s and 40s, we have a couple of really beautiful dresses that are embellished with jingles, but were clearly purchased in a department store. They had long zinc zip zippers up the side. And so that's interesting um, to think about how the jingle dress itself has evolved over the years. And so it's not, we may have the idea like Ellen Red Blanket, everybody made their own dress. Well, that wasn't the case in the 30s, in the 40s. And so the jingle dress is always evolving and women bring their own um, eye to its design. And, you know, I think of that young woman up in Manitoba at Swan Lake who sells the jingles, the red jingles, the copper colored jingles, right? So there's, um, it does, there's tradition just like the powwow, but there's continual evolution, creativity, and women bring their own ideas um, to the dress in different locations at different places, you know, in now uh, across the US and Canada. So can you explain more about the evolution of the, of the material? If making them changed, material access or change or are there just different preferences? So I think the question is about, is it because the, uh, the women have access to different materials to make them out of it or is it just a matter of preference? I think they, um, early on there was uh, uh, access to materials was a big issue. And now you think of, wow, if I'm gonna make a jingle dress, what would I do? I'd go to the fabric store, I'd pick out the most wonderful thing, but, um, you know, what we saw with the dresses in our exhibit that were came out of the Minnesota Historical Society's collection is that there's one really beautiful beaded with a big collar uh, dress. You know, it had Ojibwe style beadwork on it, it was black velvet. But when you lifted up that big collar underneath was calico fabric, um, the, um, the, what do they call the clothing? experts, the, you know, restoration work on clothing who work the historical society, they said that the um, calico was from the 1890s, right? So you had to reuse your fabric, right? You didn't just run down to the strip mall and buy your new fabric. You had to be very careful about, and that collar underneath was beautiful. It was like black calico, it was lovely, but it was reused. We also had a really old Dakota skirt in the exhibit. And I talk about some of the dresses in that documentary, but the skirt, um, you might wanna watch it if you really, if any of you really like to see the dresses we had in the exhibit. But the Dakota skirt we had was made, it was really old and the historical society only let us use the skirt. There's a jacket that went with it and they, did, they thought it was too fragile for it to be on display. And so I always say, well, so you want no one to ever see it again then? What, what's the point? But anyway, we got the skirt and I was happy to have it, but it was almost like a mustard yellow color. And they, um, the dress conservation folks said that it was probably made out of drapery fabric and originally had been green. And you see green kind of like in, you know, faded in and out of that particular item. And so the material that people had access to, so then you're going to start shopping in town and buy your, you know, everyone's, not everyone's making their own dresses in the 30s and the 40s, and you start to see that influence on the um, jingle dresses as well. But probably our favorite 
um, dress that um, women brought in their dresses. So we had a his, the dresses behind the glasses, glass cases, and then women started bringing in their dresses and men as well brought their, you know, our spiritual leader from central Minnesota, Obazan, brought in his mother's jingle dress that was quite lovely. Um, but the favorite one in the exhibit was a woman from the Fond du Lac Ojibwe community, which is near Duluth, Minnesota. And she brought in her jingle dress she made out of her former police uniform. And it has, um, you know, it's a police uniform in, the, in a jingle dress. And someone had told me about her and said, oh, what about that woman from Fond du Lac who dresses in that police uniform? And she was kind enough to loan it to us. The exhibit at Mille Lacs, uh, for any of you um, up for a big um, driving trip this summer, will, uh, the exhibit will reopen in, um, in June and be open for the season until next October. So a lot of the museums were closed, as was our exhibit a lot in the past year. So we're happy that it will get another season um, this summer. We have a question. Um, is there any similar tradition from earlier times that might have inspired the jingle dress tradition, tradition to arise around uh, the, um, the same time, but in more than one place? So they're kind of antecedents that people might have been drawing on. I think during this period of trouble, um, I have read of um, and seen historical documents about people having visions, new, new dances being performed, new songs being composed, um, because it was such a troubled period for many people, but especially for Ojibwe people in the US and Canada during that time. So it wasn't unusual to see um, records, I think, at that particular time. Yeah, there was something else I was going to say, but it's 8.08 .08 and I can't think of what, <laughs> what it was I was going to say. Oh dear, we're making you work overtime. I know, you could, we could take one more question or comment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, I, I, was gonna, I was gonna say, um, I have to warn you, St. John's College doesn't pay overtime, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, though there's a question, are there traditional protocols in making a jingle dress in your research were there certain colors that were used for making the dress or what, are, what protocols might, there, might have there been? Yeah, so, um, and I don't want to um, portray myself as an expert. That sounds like a funny thing to say, an expert on the making of jingle dresses. Um, I'm kind of, um, like I say, I've never been a jingle dress dancer myself. And I talk to a lot of people who make jingle dresses looking at them, it looks like there is tremendous, um, there's a lot of change, but there are, there are a lot of continuities as well. Like I was talking about that dress with the calico collar, I would not be surprised to see um, someone wearing a dress very much like that at a powwow today. I think that there are a lot of stories associated with the making of jingle dresses that have kind of cropped up um, over the years, uh, like I say, at the Mille Lacs community, there's this kind of celebration of those four colors associated with that dress. But I think also the real continuity, we also have to remember it is a women's, you know, and I think a radical new tradition when it came up, because the important thing to remember in this, the historical context, it was also the time of the dance order from Washington when ritualistic dancing was being suppressed by the Indian office. And you think, um, I'm teaching federal Indian policy this semester. And on the first day we were looking at uh, Ojibwe, we were looking at um, the pandemic in Indian country. And we started, I showed them my documentary on the jingle dress dance and we were talking about it. And we were just kind of so, you know, one of the points I always want to make with students in particular is that even when you look at policy coming out of 
Ottawa, coming out of Washington, DC, it's always a negotiation when it comes to Indian people. When that dance order came out of Washington, I was reading with them historical documents about it. And the, the, the headmen from the Pueblos in Northern New Mexico responded in letters to DC saying, what, you want us to quit dancing? And they said, let us put this in terms you will understand. Dancing is our opera. It's our drama. It's our art. Why would we want to give up dancing, right? And Native people um, across the country were always, and in US and Canada, always responding, always talking back. And so I think the reason why looking at like the Standing Rock or the Idle No More, the way to kind of contextualize the jingle dress is it started in a moment when dance was being suppressed, when assimilation was what was supposed to be happening. And at this very moment, Indian women, indigenous women are creating, the Ojibwe women are creating a whole new healing tradition at this same moment that it's being suppressed. One that's still with us a century later. And so that's what I find really awesome about the jingle dress, kind of looking at it as a historian. But at the same time, like, um, do you remember the Google Doodle in June? Do you remember the doodle that was the jingle dress doodle? It was all over Google. It was their doodle. It was in Canada. It was in the US. It was in June of 2019. And look it up. It was a Canadian. It was the first time Google had hired um, a, um, a native artist to create one of their doodles. And it was, I can't think of his name, but he's a young, um, young man from Canada. And he had a very Morriso looking jingle dress, uh, jingle dress dancers for this little doodle that was in June, 2019. And that was kind of a fun moment for me. I have a colleague um, that I met on the board of the NMAI Smithsonian who worked for um, Google and he's Cherokee, but he said, oh, he, I was, my book had just come out and he was saying, the jingle dress would make a fantastic doodle. And so we talked about this. And I was thinking when that came out, um, it was, I mean, I was very proud because I was thinking, wow, this is going out into the universe, right? And this is a tradition that I learned about from my grandmother, Jeanette Aganash in our little hometown of Red Bee, Minnesota, right? And that um, and that was even before the pandemic, right? And so it's kind of amazing to me to think about the endurance, but also the great meaning that people um, have found in the jingle dress dance, that it is about healing. I think it's, you know, it's about psychological healing. And we know, yeah, thank you for the name of the artist in the chat that this is, um, you know, where are we headed in this next year? We know that when our bodily sickness and our vaccines, you know, that's not the end, right? You still have to think about the trauma that you've been through. You have to think of this ordeal. And that's where the jingle dress, you know, I think will have a very interesting life in the next year or years to come. Well, um, I think that is uh, perhaps a great moment um, to begin our thank you uh, to Dr. Child for a really remarkable talk. My name is Adele Perry and I'm a historian at the University of Manitoba and a senior fellow at the college. And it is my honor to offer a Chimegwich and Ekosani uh, and Marcy to Dr. Child for coming from her part of the Anishinaabe world to our part of it uh, via the power of Zoom. Like Dr. Jones, I have long been a fan of Dr. Child's insightful, rich scholarship, work that always puts Indigenous women and family at the center of North American history. 
her presentation tonight on the origins of the jingle dance in amid the influenza pandemic um, of 1918-19 shows us all of this in ways that are particularly powerful at the end at this particular moment one year into another global pandemic so thank you to dr child for a powerful um, gracious and very timely talk thank you Miigwech, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. And in these days of social isolation, how nice to be able to share an evening with all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. I really, I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I have a dozen questions for you. So you may be getting an email from me. <laughs> no worries. That'll, that'll be great. I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.